The Bible does not say that drinking is a bad thing. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for being here with me. I am going through these questions and I'm just, I'm continually blown away by um, how many people reach out to ask a question for this podcast. And it's encouraging for me, the wide variety of questions that we get. And uh, that allows me to to pivot around. As you can see on this table, if you're watching, I don't have any notes. I don't have any books. Uh, I'm just walking through whatever comes to my mind, which sometimes means that I'm, I might look back on some of these episodes a year down the road, several months down the road and go, I would have answered that differently now. If I had thought about it a little bit more, I might have answered it differently. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt. As I answer these questions, which you could email me, by the way, podcast at grangersmith.com podcast at grangersmith.com. That's the email. And as you email me, uh, just keep in mind that you're asking me as if you're just asking a friend, hey, I got a question for you. Um, c- could you could you give me some advice? Can you tell me what you would do in this situation maybe? Uh, in, in all those instances, we're going to talk about it like you and I are just uh, sitting in the cab of a truck or sitting around a campfire or hanging out on a porch swing. And it's like, hey, Granger, I got, I got something going on. Let me let me run it by you. And I'm going to answer top of my head, first thing that comes to mind, walk it through as I would on the fly with a friend. That's the basis of this podcast. The first question I have says this. It's from Jamie. And it says, hello, Granger. If I may start up by saying how your YouTube videos and podcasts have been such a blessing in my life. I've watched you evolve and grow in this new season of life. And all I could say is, wow. Look what the Lord has done. Amen to that. In an episode of The Smiths, I watched you prepare for uh, a message and you chose not to lead the sinner's prayer. You said it's not biblical. I think I understand your belief regarding this, but would you mind elaborating on this? Uh, I would love to hear your biblical perspective. Thank you, Jamie. Wow, was not expecting that. First question. So what she's talking about is there There was an episode of The Smiths, and that's our YouTube uh, channel that's our family vlog. And sometimes, uh, a lot of times, I, it's completely off the cuff, and I'm, I'm going to take you on the adventures that my family go on. And in this particular adventure, I was on a televangelist show in Dallas. It's like the heart of televangelism. And the guy says, and I, and I actually had the, ta- the camera sitting on the table recording the whole conversation, and he caught me off guard by saying... Uh, after you finish your your conversation with us, we're just going to interview you. After we finish the conversation, I'd like you to lead everyone in the sinner's prayer. And I said, no, sir, I, I don't want to do that. And he, and this has happened a couple times to me where the, the person will then say, oh, it's not that big a deal. We could tell you what to say. And I'm like, I know what you want me to say. It's not that. It's not a lack of me knowing what you want me to say. Uh, and then the, the, this one guy followed up by saying, well, brother, let me help increase your faith. And it's like, well, okay, let's, it, that's not that either. It's not me not knowing what to say. I know, you know, I've heard Joel Osteen say it a thousand times. And it's also not a lack of faith. It's not like I need more faith or confidence or boldness to be able to step out and say it. It's not, it's not either one of those. Um, the reason I hesitate with what we have called now in modern evangelism in the last hundred years, what we have labeled as the sinner's prayer, which says something along the lines of, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I want you as my Lord and Savior. I want you as my Lord and Savior. I want to turn to you and give you my, give, him, give you my everything. I want to turn to you and give you my everything. Come into my life and take my, take my soul, take my life. It's yours. Take my, come, uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And then like some people will say, if you just repeated that prayer with me, then you are now a Christian. You are reborn. And so welcome to the family. And, and so it's, it's fascinating that we have gotten away with this in modern evangelism. 
in a way that we have now created this this turnkey system where you just say this, you you say you repeat these words, these magical words like genie in a bottle, and then suddenly you are granted access to the keys of the kingdom of heaven because you, you literally repeated a prayer which is not in the Bible. There, there is not a time in the Bible where anybody, a prophet or an apostle or Jesus or a disciple or an apprentice of an apostle, there is not a time when someone says, repeat after me, say this, and you'll be saved. Th- that doesn't happen. And so it's scary to me to put that kind of responsibility on me. So why? Why, why Granger? Why does it matter? Like, why do you if it's not in the Bible, but it's still something that is helpful, possibly, why why would you be against this, Granger? Maybe your question is. Because I don't want to be responsible as someone who, who loves the Lord and, and loves the lost and wants to speak to those who are lost and desperately wants people to hear the gospel and desperately wants people to realize their own depravity and to be saved— is someone who desperately wants that and also knows that it's the Lord that does it. It is the Lord that opens their hearts. In fact, I'm preparing for a message right now. And if you remember Lydia from Acts 16, when Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke go into Philippi and they they go to this, they go next to this river. This is top of mind because I'm about to preach this. They go to the next to this river. And it says they they preach the gospel to the women there at the riverside where they went to pray. And one heard them, and the Lord opened her ears to what Paul was saying. The Lord did it. The Lord turned her. The Lord opened her ears. The Lord opened her heart. Salvation belongs to the Lord, the Bible says. So I don't want to manipulate that, the the Lord's power in salvation, and manipulate it and say, you are, congratulations, welcome to the family. You're saved. Here's the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. I I hear there's good bass fishing here. I don't want to do that and then give them a false sense of assurance so that then they could just go live their lives and go, yeah, I checked the box. I remember one time with Granger, I checked the box. He, he asked me to repeat a prayer and I repeated it. So I'm good on the religious thing. What else does life have to offer? Because I got that. What else could I do? That is scary to me and I don't want that responsibility. So Jesus in his great commission told the disciples to go forth to all nations, preaching the gospel, teaching them to obey everything that he said, making disciples, which really means walking through life with them. So it's not just one prayer, done, bam, we're, we're good. It's, it's a walk, it's a lifelong walk to, to make disciples, to show them, to reveal to them the gospel. And th- that's, that's why I, I don't I don't, that's why I don't agree with the sinner's prayer. I don't, I don't judge or look down on people that do it. I don't, I don't. I just don't want to be the one, the one responsible going, yeah, I gave that person a false sense of assurance. So instead, I, w- I want to preach the gospel and let the word, the gospel itself, do its work through people, through hearing. And then I want to walk through that. I'm going to say, let me just, let me walk through life with you. Let me continue to answer questions like on this podcast. Let's continue this journey together so that I could learn with you. We could learn together as, as we walk down this road. And um, that's why I, I, I don't look down on people that, that ask for people to repeat the sinner's prayer, but I just don't want to do it. Look, look at it this way. If someone, if a man committed adultery on his wife and you came to him and said, look, we could make this right with your wife, follow me. We'll go, we're going to go talk to her. And you go to her house and she answers the door and you say, Hey, we're here to tell you something, ma'am. Repeat after me. Um, wife, wife, I am, I have messed up. I have messed up. I am so sorry that I have done this to you. I'm so sorry I've done this to you. Forgive me for what I've done. And Come into my life as my wife. Forgive me for what I've done. Come into my life as my wife. Okay, great. Congratulations. You guys are good. You see, that, that's, that's what it feels like to me to say the sinner's prayer to Jesus. 
It's like, no, <laughs> that wasn't that there was no heart to that. There could be. Okay. Let me say that too. Let me, let me just drag this question out a little bit longer. There could be heart to it and people could genuinely be saved through that. And at, at an altar, at some service that someone might have done this. In fact, I know people listening were saved through something like that. So absolutely, it could happen. It could. But I don't want to be responsible for those that it tricked them into thinking that it was and it wasn't. You know what I mean? For instance, if I take the guy to the house, to the, to, to the, guy, to the wife's house, and we say it, he could mean it. And she could take him back. But it also just as likely could be not sincere at all. And she doesn't take him back. And he doesn't even mean it. That's why. It's a good question. <laughs> I appreciate you asking. And I'm sorry that I, I drug it out um, just a little bit. This podcast is brought to you by Better Help. You know, Amber and I, when going through a lot of trauma in our lives, turn to therapy to be able to sort through all the kinds of different conflicts that were happening throughout our PTSD. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen and kind of sort through the, the rubble that's rolling around in our brains, right? For all of us, therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, especially this time of year during this holiday season. You know, sometimes it just gives you practical coping skills for whatever you're dealing with. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Granger today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Granger. You know, I say this year round, but especially during the holidays, if you're looking for a gift for somebody last minute, maybe someone that has everything already, you can't think of anything for them, but maybe they're a fan of me or this podcast or my music or my family or any of my YouTube channels. Have you ever thought of cameo.com? What that is, is it allows me to shoot you a quick video message about a minute long, just saying something that you need me to say to that person getting the gift. It could be uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, a word of encouragement, maybe a happy birthday. Hey, hey, just thinking about you. And what happens is I get my phone and I, and I read your message, what you suggest for me to say in bullet points. And then I take my phone and I record a, a selfie video and send it back to you. Then you give it to that person. It's a great last minute gift idea and super simple for all of us. You can find me at cameo, C-A-M-E-O dot com slash Granger Smith. Or you could download the Cameo app and search for me, Granger Smith. Again, that's cameo.com slash Granger Smith. All right, next question here, emailed to podcast at grangersmith.com says, Hey, Granger, what are your thoughts on alcohol and the culture of getting tipsy, drunk, being a good thing? Also, I have friends that enjoy casual drinking and I can't help but getting internally upset or uncomfortable with it. Any thoughts or advice would be great. Thank you. This comes from John, 20 years old, from Illinois. Um, yeah, man, thanks Thanks for the email, John. So first of all, uh, underage drinking 20 and below is uh, illegal in most places, in Illinois at least. Um, so there's that. We could start with that. Um, but, but that's not what you were asking. And that's surely not to say that I didn't do it when I was 20. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Um, what are your thoughts on alcohol and the culture of getting tipsy, drunk, being a good thing? That's an interesting question that the way that you worded it, what are your thoughts on getting drunk as being a good thing? Well, the Bible says it's not a good thing, right? So we'll just, we can go right to it there. Um, the Bible does not say that drinking is a bad thing. It says that getting drunk is Getting tipsy is. Numbing yourself is. By any means, not just alcohol. You, we, could, we could use this with anything, any substance at all. Um, and Including caffeine, if you're using it in that way. If you're using caffeine in a way to forget or to numb a, a feeling or to dull your senses in a way. I'm, I'm just using that as an extreme example, but... Um, anything used in that kind of addictive manner to, 
to habitually forget or numb or dull or, or soften the realities of the world is a sin. That We could go deep into that, but we probably shouldn't. I think that's pretty clear. Um, um, I think it's clear if you followed me in my life, a lot of you have followed me for many years, it's clear that uh, it took me a long time to see that, but not in a legalistic way, not a, in a moralistic way, like, hey, you do that, you're going to hell. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying when you become a Christian, when you have new eyes to see, you should start hating things that God hates. Does that make sense? So instead of just saying alcohol is bad, forget it, you're going to hell. If you, I'm not saying that. I'm saying a good, a good fruit, a, a good outcropping overflow of an evidence of a saving faith should be that you start to see things that the Bible says is defeating to you, is corrupting to you. You should start seeing those things more and more, maybe gradually, sometimes all at once. Sometimes you wake up all at once, but you start. You should start seeing them as things that you want to rid yourself from. And you don't necessarily, because none of us are perfect, so you don't necessarily rid all of it at once. But you cult, the, 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 the desire that I believe is God breathed into you starts begins to cultivate a rejection of things that the Bible hates. You go, man, I just, I, I used to like drinking. I used to hang out with my buddies. And this is, a, this is real for me. I used to hang out, used to, used to enjoy it. And slowly, as I became sanctified, which that's what that word means, we start to be made new. We start to be made clean and, and renewed in the image of Christ, our King, our Creator. Once we're a slave to sin, and then we become a slave to Christ. And so as we once were like sin, we looked like sin, we smelled like sin, we tasted like sin, and then we were reborn from Christ, through Christ, by Christ, through the Spirit, we become more like Him. We start looking and smelling and tasting more like Him. And as that happens, that process, that shedding away, is called sanctification, and we start to look at the old self the old slave that we were to sin, and we go, oh, I don't like the taste of that anymore, metaphorically or physically with alcohol. I don't like the taste anymore. Not that it's bad to have a drink, a glass of wine, a, a, a mixed drink with your wife on her birthday, the, things like that. Not that that's wrong, but it is wrong to get drunk. And and so when you when you start having two or three or four more, you start getting close to this danger zone. Why risk it? Um, because I'm in seminary right now, and Amber is as well, we can't have any. So there's that. And if I continue uh, on this path, um, it's I, I, it's been over a year now since I've had a, a, just even a drop of alcohol. Once again, not legalistic, not moralistic, not um, I'm not pushing any kind of moralism on anybody. I'm just saying... That's where I am. That's where I stand. And you probably have noticed that uh, over the course of years as, as I, my conversion to Christianity has been very public. Um, let me get to the second, second part of your question here. I have friends that enjoy casual drinking, and I can't help getting internally upset or uncomfortable with it. Stop that. Stop that. That's when you're getting legalistic and, and you're pushing moralism on them. If you are truly reborn, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, if you are saved by the blood of Christ, then that's you. You are now what the Bible would metaphorically call a sheep. And if you're not, you're metaphorically called a goat. So don't try to tell goats how to be a sheep. Don't force sheepism on a goat because it doesn't make sense to them. It just comes across as judgy right? So don't do that. Instead, we tell them the gospel. We tell them, we tell them how we were saved. We tell them what God did for us. We tell them the beauty of the gospel. We tell them that we were covered, that our, that our guilt is covered, our, our shame, our sin is forgotten by God, remembered no more, but not because of anything we did, not because we stopped drinking alcohol, but because what he did for us and in gratitude 
for that kind of, that kind of saving grace, that saving faith that is gifted to us from gratitude, we then look back and go, I, I, I am so thankful for what he did. I, I don't want to touch that alcohol. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I used to do it. I don't want to do it anymore. So you see that there's a difference between that, what I just said, I keep hitting this microphone, what I just said, and then a difference between telling your friends, hey, y'all shouldn't be drinking that alcohol, man. Y'all shouldn't be getting drunk. The Bible says don't get drunk. Play very safe with that. Don't try to tell goats how to be sheep. Instead, tell the goats about God. Tell them about the gospel. Tell them what Jesus did on the cross. And let them drink while you're doing it. Let them drink while you're doing it. Now, if they're saved, if they are believers, and they're getting drunk, and they're in your church, now you have a, 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 a right at this point to say, brothers, brothers, listen, you're, you're in sin right now. Bring other people from the church with you. Brothers, you're in sin. Let us, let us help you. Let us encourage you. Let us walk you out of this, right? Hopefully, um, I painted that picture in a way that, that, that sounds biblical and sounds um, not uh, humanly, universally judgy, right? Thanks for the question, John. Um, next question here is from Lindsay. And she says, hey, Granger, my name is Lindsay from Oklahoma City. Love listening to your podcast every week and keeping up with the Smiths on YouTube. I'm a follower of Jesus and truly believe he is our sole provider and everything happens within our lives according to his plan. I'm curious what your thoughts are on manifestation. I feel like uh, a common idea I hear on other podcasts and social media recently is that the idea of manifesting it into existence, if you want something bad enough or desire uh, something to happen in your life, all you have to do is manifest it or speak it into existence. This has been on my mind recently, and I would love to know your thoughts on this idea. Do you believe it's possible to manifest something into existence? Thank you for reading this. Look forward to hearing your response, Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay, thanks for the great question. I appreciate you. And I too hear a lot about this. And I absolutely believe in um, speaking something into existence. I absolutely believe in manifesting 100% because Genesis 1 says it happens. God spoke it into existence. He spoke his word and he spoke creation from nothing. Ex nihilo is what it's in, in, uh, in Latin. Ex nihilo means it came from nothing. He created from nothing with his word. He spoke and it happened. There was, there was chaos, then there was order. There was nothing, then there was something. He spoke it, he manifested it just from a word. That's amazing. Can we do it? <laughs> no, we cannot do that. No, that's a joke. Absolutely not. There is, uh, that is a joke to think that anyone says, I want to manifest it into existence, like it, it didn't happen, and then you speak it, and it does, is, is horrible philosophy. And, um, and I think you could just better, you, it, it's better just to sum up that idea with work hard, work ethic, work for it, go get it. Don't, don't say you're going to manifest it. You're going to, like you're, like you're a little God, lowercase g. You're just going to create something by speaking it into existence. No, you're going to, you're going to look at a, um, you're going to look at a piece of property that you want, a little farm and you go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to work. I'm going to work for this piece of property and I'm going to build a farmhouse on this property. Not because I'm speaking it into existence or manifesting it, but I'm going to start slowly saving some money. I'm going to work a second job. I might pick up a third job. I'm going to make some smart investments. I'm going to stay smart with my funding. I'm going to sell that expensive pickup truck and get a cheaper one. And I'm going to slowly save and slowly put away. And then when the time comes, I'll be able to buy that property. And then I'm going to start talking to some builders and we're going to, we're going to create a budget and I'm going to work hard. And then we're going to start building a house, not because I'm manifesting or speaking into existence, but because I made a plan and I talked to a, an advisor and a banker and a CPA and I, I covered it all in prayer. And I said, Lord, if, if, if this is your will for me to be on this property and build a home here, give me the desire for that. Open the doors that we need to walk through and close the ones that we don't, right? So you put all the trust in him and then you work your butt off and that's how you get it. Or you, that's how you don't get it. Either way, uh, it's in the Lord's hands. 
We prepare the horse for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord, the Bible says. Trust in him and work hard and forget about manifesting. All right, next question is from Anonymous. It says, hey, Granger, first off, I just wanted to say I enjoy listening to your podcast as you've answered some questions I've always wondered about. I feel closer to the Lord now because of it. Praise God for that. Uh, My question involves raising my kids. I have friends who don't allow their kids to watch Disney movies such as princess ones because they involve witches and magic. I, however, let my kids watch them but still teach them that magic is not real or that witches are real. And I tell them that God doesn't like those things. So... Uh, to me, I feel like my friends are, my friends not letting them watch those movies are sheltering their children from learning what is right and wrong. Uh, it's just a little kid's movie. You could teach them that it's okay to watch it, but remember that it's not real life. I get annoyed when I see people letting their kids wear the dress up clothes for the movie, yet can't watch the movie itself. Am I wrong in feeling this way? Okay, thanks, Anonymous. Thanks for the email, brother. Um, yeah, this is, it's kind of, kind of, uh, okay. That you're worried, it's bothering you that other brothers and sisters in Christ are being, uh, are, are raising their kids in a certain way apart from you. Um, and you have to understand and I don't want to go too deep into this, but you have to understand that that everyone is going to raise their kids the way that they feel is right, the way they're convicted, but that sh- also shouldn't let it bother you. So for instance, take the question about alcohol a few questions ago on this podcast. Um, that's like saying, look, I've got a, a brother from church and he doesn't drink at all alcohol at all. And I like to have a... a glass of wine on the porch swing with my wife on Friday nights. And he doesn't. And I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of him living this life of not drinking and now can, acting like he's better than me. Right? That's kind of what you're saying about this. Hey, I'm sick and tired of these families not allowing them to watch Disney movies. Like they're all uppity, taking the, the moral high ground. And, and, looking down on me down here because I let my kids watch princess movies. And I, and I tell them that, that magic is not real and witches are not real and God doesn't like those things. Brother, if that's what you want to do, if that's how you want to raise your kids, then go with it. But don't worry about what the guy down the street's doing. He's raising his kids the best way he knows how. You're raising your kids, Lord willing, the best way you know how. I don't, I don't see... A problem either way. I don't know on this podcast if you want me to say I agree with them. Disney is bad or I agree with you. Forget all those people. Disney's good. I'm I'm not going to take either one of those positions. I'm just going to say let people be convicted on their in their own sanctification with that word we talked about earlier. Let people be convicted on their own and live a life that makes Jesus look fantastic. That's our purpose. Live a life glorifying God, meaning live a life that makes Jesus look as magnificent as he is. And the result of doing that, one of the results, I should say, not the result, one of the outcroppings of that is you feel joy. You don't worry. You're not not anxious about how your neighbor is raising a kid. Not that you are, but I want to kind of put that barrier up before it gets to that point because those kind of things could start kind of kind of uh, disintegrating the friendship that you might have built up, okay? Next question comes from Stephanie. She says, I have a question about the new heaven and new earth. My understanding that is once Jesus returns, we will be welcomed into our heavenly home to live with our Father. I'm assuming at that point we will be made perfect without any evil desires, jealousy, etc. But can we be assured that there will never be another fallen angel that turns out uh, to be evil like Satan did? Um, was the first heaven imperfect to allow such a being to come into existence? Where in the Bible does it assure us that this will never happen again? Thanks for all you do, Stephanie. Stephanie, good question. Thank you for for it. I, and I don't have any notes in front of me or a Bible in front of me for stuff like this, but I could still answer the question without that. Um, 
what we have to understand is that God's plan did not fail. Let's start there. God's plan, when he, when he breathed and spoke existence, right? Spoke the universe into existence, the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. There was not a problem with that. There was not a, oh no, I accidentally made it imperfect, and then Satan and his hooligans wrecked it and went down there to the garden and then screwed up Adam and Eve. And, oh man, so hopefully the next one I build, the new one will be perfect and won't have that problem. That's, that's an incorrect idea of who God is. What we know is revealed in the Bible, and I don't have to have it in front of me to, to give you specific examples. I could tell you through 66 books, through the whole council of God, that what's revealed to us is He is providential. He is sovereign. He is all planning. And from the beginning of time, this was part of the plan, even the fall. Jesus going to the cross as a substitute for sin, that was part of a plan. So the fall leading up to the sacrifice on the cross at Calvary by the sacrificial lamb, the Son of God, Jesus, the, the fall and everything leading to that was all part of the plan. And redemption was all part of the solution to the original plan. And the redemption that Jesus accomplished for us when he says, it is finished, tetelestai, it is finished. When he says that, it means done, accomplished. Plan was made, it was carried out, and it was finished, accomplished. There will not be another fall. There will not be any kind of fallen angel or corruption ever again in the new heavens, the new earth. All of that is finished. So take it as what Jesus says from the cross, it is finished. Take that as your assurance that what has happened before that and the fallen angels and all the stuff you're talking about was supposed to be. Think about that. Dwell on that but not too long, and then go back to the gospel and, and look at what that, at that blood from Jesus accomplished for you and your belief for him so that he could reconcile you, a sinner, a rebel, just like the fallen angels, reconciled back to himself so you could be with God, the creator, the one that breathed everything, everything into existence. Dwell on that. Think about that. That'll fill you with so much excitement and so much joy and so much gratitude that you'll start thinking about, oh, I wonder if God's going to let us down in heaven and angels might fall again. Don't worry about that. It's a good question, though. Please don't think of, don't think of my answer as, being, uh, as making yours sound like a, not a good question. Next one's anonymous. It says, I am 20 years old and I live in Canada. And in the next week, I will be asking my girlfriend of almost two years to marry me. This is a huge step, and I'm so excited, but I have a problem. Ever since I've made the official decision to ask her, I seem to notice other women around me more. Like I see a random girl, and instantly I'm attracted to the way she looks. I try to keep reminding myself that the girl I have is so much more than I even deserve, but that doesn't get rid of the thoughts. There's nothing wrong in my current relationship that should make me want something different. My girlfriend is beautiful and God-honoring. Do you think this is temptations from Satan to sidetrack our goal of having a biblical covenantal marriage? And if, do you have any suggestions on what to do? Is prayer the way out? Uh, just looking for your thoughts. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so interesting, anonymous. It's a good question, brother. I, I appreciate you asking, and um, I'm not laughing at you. I'm, I'm, I'm joining you in a uh, in all of us listening, going, "Yep, <laughs> that sounds that sounds right on track." Um, first of all, you say, "Do you think this temptation is from Satan to sidetrack our goal of having a biblical covenantal marriage?" Well, I'd say absolutely. That's not um, that's not a far off assumption at all because Satan hates marriage. He, he hates um, the love of a man and a, and a woman in a, in a biblical marriage. He hates that. So of course he's going to do everything he can to sidetrack it, to destroy it. Um, I think there's also, so there is that, and I think through that, 
um, you're also just feeling a, a bit of human panic that now you're going to all of a sudden be with one woman the rest of your life and you it is now um, a problem for you to be attracted to others in that kind of way because you're, you're, you're going to have a wondering eye and there is no way out of it forever. So I think there's just a natural feeling you're going through. And if you asked her to marry you, I believe a couple things. One, I believe this is a natural feeling that you're now looking at other girls and going, oh, she's cute. Look, it's kind of like um, when you go buy a, a, a truck at a dealership. And hypothetically, you drive off of the lot. And as soon as you sign that that contract at the dealership to drive off with that truck, there is a buyer's remorse that comes along with it. And part of the buyer's remorse is, oh man, I'm stuck with this truck. And I, don't get me wrong, I love this truck and it drives great. And I worked hard to earn money for this truck. And this is the truck I researched over and over. And this is the one I wanted, but it's the only one I get. And you look around, you go, as you're driving out of the dealership and you see other trucks and then you go to the first stoplight and right, right across from you and the other stoplight, another truck pulls up. It's a different color. The one you're driving is blue and you see a red one and you haven't quite seen that red color. In fact, in all of your research and everything you did to buy that truck, you hadn't really thought about red like that because that dealership didn't have red ones. It only had blue and gray, silver, and black and white, but you haven't quite seen red and there's a red one and then your heart starts beating and you go, man, did I do, did I make a wrong decision? It doesn't matter. I'm stuck. I already signed the paper. The contract is done. I have this blue truck and that red truck is beautiful and I'll never get it. <laughs> okay. So that's the, all analogies break down eventually. So it's not a great analogy, but it's a little bit of the human feeling that you have when you get engaged. So I'm qualifying that. I'm saying, okay, your feeling is normal. But then I'm going to say this. Here's the second thing I'm going to say. Kill it. You have, through the gospel, as a Christian, a God-enabled ability to kill it, to kill sin, to destroy it, to pull it out from its root and throw it away into the fire. You have that ability. Don't deny the idea that the Bible tells you you have the ability to pluck that sin out from the root and throw it out before it grows any further. And here's my assurance to you that as you do pluck that sin out and re you realize that it's natural, it's a human tendency, you're, there's nothing wrong with you besides you're a sinner like we all are, but there's nothing different about you. So you pluck the root out, the, the weed, and you throw it away from the root and you throw it in the fire and you continue to move. And my assurance to you is that as you walk down the road with your new wife, with your blue truck, as you continue down this road, and then she has your first child, Lord willing, and you go through some, some, some problems, and you make your way out on the other side, and then, Lord willing, you, you have another child, and then you work through some other problems. Maybe somebody in the family gets sick, maybe your dad, and then you work through that side by side with your wife, and you come out on the other side, and you continue Every time you walk through these trials and you walk through these joyful moments and you build these memories and you have, you have Christmas mornings together and you, you, you stand side by side at funerals and you hold hands at someone else's wedding and you remember your own. As that happens and you walk through life like this, your love grows and grows and grows and in a way that a bond that grows so much in a way that you, you don't even think about that red truck anymore. It's like, that's somebody else's truck, and they, they might enjoy that truck, but I have gone through the fire with this blue one, right? That's what happens. That's my assurance to you is that the love you have right now is great, but it will grow and deepen and thicken and strengthen through life as you walk it together with her. So pluck it at the root, get rid of it, know that it's normal, and also know that you have an assurance that as you walk with her, it's going to be it's going to be better and better and better. I appreciate the questions, y'all. And um, this has been a fun adventure because you email me, podcast at grangersmith.com. Ant-Man, my producer, who also produces After Midnight with Granger Smith, my radio show, uh, he sources these questions and throws them into a file. 
So I do not see them as I sit here and read these. This is the first time that I've seen any of these questions uh, today because I want you to get, I want you to hear and feel and see and listen to my instant reaction to the question the same as you, as you're taking it in for the very first time as well. So that's what this podcast is. I hope you enjoy it. We have new things that we're going to kind of spin into this, into the future. So hang with us and share it with a friend if you can. I, I love you guys and thanks for being here. See you next Monday. Yee-yee. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel, hit that little like button and notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. Yee-yee.